Well, good evening, everybody, and a uh, very warm welcome uh, to this evening's talk. Um, and a very warm welcome to everyone, and thank you very much for braving uh, the weather, or rather the threat of the weather. Um, so, here's hoping that we don't get snowed in here this evening. We'll have a lovely view of the castle, the snowy <coughs> castle, if we were to be snowed. Um, but without any further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening Professor Gillian Black and Sir Crispin Agnew. Professor Gillian Black is Chair of Scots Private Law at the University of Edinburgh. Her teaching and research is in family law, <coughs> parent and child relationships and heraldry and in 2021 she was appointed Linlithgow Pursuivant Extraordinary. Sir Crispin Agnew is an advocate, herald and explorer and at the Scottish Bar he specialised in rural property and environmental law together with public law. He's also the <coughs> King's Counsel. His heraldic career began as Slane's Pursuivant in 1978, and he was an appoint appointed Unicorn Pursuivant in 1981, and then in 2021 became Albany Herald Extraordinary. And so the title of, of the talk that we're going to hear this evening is The Enigma of Sir Walter Scott's Moor Supporter, a Symbol of Slavery. And so thank you very much to Jim. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting Gillian and I uh, to give this talk. Um, its origins, really, are that Gillian and I were and are investigating symbols of slavery uh, and colonialism in Scottish heraldry uh, to discuss what should perhaps be done about it. And in that context, uh, we decided to attend a talk uh, which has led on uh, to this discussion of the enigma. So the structure of our talk is going to be an introduction to the enigma about Sir Walter Scott's coat of arms. Gillian will then give an overview of Moors and Africans in heraldry and whether they have or have not slavery connotations. I will then look at Sir Walter Scott and his supporters, the Moor, and see where they fit in and if they do have a slavery connection, and then we'll end up uh, with a conclusion. So that's uh, how we're going to uh, progress. But it all started with our sort of research into, uh, as I say, uh, slavery and colonial uh, symbols uh, in Scottish heraldry. Now, we became aware of this when we attended a talk, which you can see there, uh, African imagery uh, in British heraldry, which was given by Kelly Foster, who is an African uh, historian based in London, uh, who's interested in uh, African heritage uh, within uh, the United Kingdom. And she gave a talk uh, online during COVID times, uh, which we signed up for, uh, for our interest. And you can see uh, what she talked about. At the end of the talk, because she saw we were online as little pictures, she said, by the way, you do know uh, that Walter Scott has a moor as a supporter, and I wonder if that has slavery uh, connotations. And that triggered uh, this research for us uh, to focus more closely uh, on uh, Sir Walter Scott and to see whether there was uh, any connection. Now, the start point is Scott's grant of arms uh, in March uh, 1820. And you can see there uh, that he's got quarterly, uh, top left, Scott, top right, Halliburton. And the text uh, of the grant, which I'm sure all of you can read quite carefully, <laughs> coming from the Lion Register, is that the first and fourth quarter, that's the top left and bottom right, uh, record that Scott was a descendant of the Scots of Rayburn, who was a descendant of Scott of Harden. So that's uh, the Scott quarter. The Halliburton quarter records that Scott was the heir of his paternal grandmother, who was the heiress of Halliburton of New Mains, 
descendant and representer of the family of Halliburton of Merton. So Scott, as we, we see from other literature, was very proud of his Halliburton connection and the fact that he was descended as heir through his paternal grandmother uh, to those families. And you can see he's got the crest, uh, which is the Scott crest, and he's got a motto, uh, which is the Scott motto. The next uh, interesting thing in Scott's life, and please note that date and remember it, uh, is that in 22nd of April, 1820, Scott received the grant of a baronetcy. Uh, the important point uh, of the previous slide and date is that uh, there's a royal warrant of 1783 which says once you have been offered a baronetcy, it will not be granted to you until you produce a certificate from the heralds certifying that you're entitled to a coat of arms. So one can see that Scott uh, rushed off to the Lion Court to make sure he got a coat of arms and no doubt a certificate which he could send to the monarch uh, so that the baronets that he'd been told about uh, could be uh, confirmed to him. Now, I've cited two articles there uh, which deal with uh, how Walter Scott got his baronets in, because in some literature, Scott maintains uh, that it was a gift from the Prince Regent to him direct without any lobbying. And the authors of these uh, two articles really research that and come to the conclusion uh, that there was various lobbying on Scott's behalf as to the grant to him of a baronetcy and research into various letters. Uh, the first article covered it briefly. The second article says the first article didn't get it quite right and there was more material available. So if anybody's interested, uh, it's there for following up. But it doesn't notice uh, the date issues uh, which are uh, quite important and uh, in this context may also throw light on uh, when Scott knew he was going to get a baronet. Now, generally speaking, baronets are not entitled to supporters. Uh, that's the figures on either side of the shield. But quite a lot of Scottish baronets did have supporters because they were either clan chiefs, family, heads of family, or they were descendants of feudal barons who were entitled to supporters if they were feudal barons before I think it was 1590. So quite a lot of Scottish baronets had supporters which gave rise to this idea that Scottish baronets were entitled to supporters. And in 1821, uh, in a report to the Commission to investigate uh, the courts in Scotland, including the Lion Court, uh, the then Lion Deputy made the statement which you can uh, read there. Now this rather upset Scott, uh, because on the 15th of February 1820, and notice he his baronets, it was April uh, 1820, uh, Scott wrote to uh, Lord Melville, who, as you know, was really the chief government minister in Scotland, saying, here's the rub that baronets have always got supporters, and I'm flattered by uh, my appointment to come, and he's therefore concerned that he should get supporters too, and then he floats the idea that uh, he's entitled to them anyway as the heir uh, in all of the barons of Merton. So Scott was rather upset and was raising this issue. And of course, he got to get a coat of arms first to get the baronetcy. And he couldn't get supporters with it if baronets were entitled to it until he got the baronetcy. So he started lobbying uh, for supporters, effectively. And in 1822, uh, he received a regrant, uh, he rematriculated his arms and obtained a grant of supporters. Now, I can only assume that the Lord Lyon gave them to him as heir of the barons of Merton, because feudal barons and their heirs uh, were entitled to supporters rather than as a baronet, when one looks at what uh, the Lyon deputy had said in 
his letter in his uh, in his uh, report to the the commission on the Scottish courts. So uh, there's nothing uh, there's nothing in the Lard Register. You will see sometimes a baronet or somebody else is granted supporters when not normally entitled to them. There's a royal warrant issued by the sovereign authorizing supporters to be uh, granted to a particular person. And those are invariably, one says, usually recorded in the Lyon Register, uh, but we haven't uh, seen uh, any of that uh, in this recording. But you'll see in the center is the Red Hand of Ulster, which is the mark of a baronet, other than a baronet of Scotland or Nova Scotia, who have a different uh, in, in a Scotchman. Uh, so that shows that he's a baronet. The Red Hand comes from uh, 1611, uh, when James I instituted the baronets of England, who each paid £1,000 uh, to support six soldiers in Ulster uh, to put down the ongoing rebellion. And he gave them this augmentation of a red hand. And you can see uh, on the left is the mermaid, uh, which is uh, comes from the Scot side, and the motto at the top, uh, which comes from the Scots side as well above the crest. On the right is the enigma. Why did Scott have a moor, as it's called, an African figure, naked except for a lion cloth, loin cloth and a headband? And he's carrying in his hand, his left hand, a flaming torch. Now a flaming torch was the symbol, in many cases, of enslaved people in rebellion. Uh, it was the recognized symbol or trope uh, for that because they went around with a flaming torch, setting fire to the sugar plantations, burning down their slave owner's uh, house and all the rest. And here's Scott being given a black African holding a flaming <laughs> A, a flaming uh, torch, uh, which it was and is a well-known symbol of slaves in revolt, and slave people in revolt. Now, why was this granted? And that was the enigma uh, which we set out to try and solve. And you'll also see that he has a watch wheel, uh, which is the Halliburton motto. So I'll now uh, hand over to Gillian, who will explain uh, how African imagery works in heraldry. Thank you very much, Crispin. Um, so for the next uh, section, I'm going to take you away from Scott, and we're going to look at the use of Africans and Moors in heraldry. And I'm going to start by giving you some examples that we picked up from Kelly Foster in her talk, um, one from England and one from Ireland, to show how um, these uh, enslaved people in particular can be represented. So the first um, coat of arms, these are English arms belonging to Sir John Hawkins, and you can see um, at the top is his crest, which is a, a black African bound, um, so uh, ropes round the chest and arms to bind them. <laughs> um, the arms themselves have a, a representation of the sea at the bottom, and lion and some gold peasants, presumably for money. And these are the arms of Sir John Hawkins, who was an English naval commander and enslaver in the 16th century. Um, he actually pioneered and was an early promoter of English involvement in the Atlantic slave trade and he's considered to be the first English merchant to profit from the triangle trade, so selling enslaved people in Afri from Africa to the colonies in uh, the West Indies. Um, he was knighted for gallantry in the Spanish Armada and he obviously um, sought a coat of arms and chose as his crest, representative of his trade, uh, a bound African. So this is a very clear example of somebody with a strong connection to the Atlantic slave trade choosing to represent that through the crest on their coat of arms. Um, another example is from Ireland, and it's the Donnellan arms, and you can see here there's a bound African chained to a tree. 
Now, I've done a little bit of research. Um, the O'Donnell clan is an ancient Irish clan, but I've been unable to find out why their arms show, the main family arms, show an enslaved person chained to a tree. I'm not quite sure what the connection is or what the rationale. But you can see these two very graphic depictions of enslaved people chained and bound in these two coats of arms. So Crispin and I wanted to find out if there was, if we could find similar examples in Scotland in the Lion Register. And we spent a morning at the Lion office, uh, literally turning the pages to see what examples we could find. And there are some. Uh, the first arms I'd like to share with you are the arms of the Royal Borough of Guruk. Um, and these arms are derived from the arms of Duncan Darach. Now he was a local <coughs> lad and uh, in the 18th century he made his fortune in Jamaica. And he returned to uh, the Guruk area and bought up lots of land that had formerly been owned by the Stuarts with his newfound riches and he has his coat of arms. Now these are also quartered arms um, and in the first quarter, top left, you can see the Fess Checky, that Azure and Argent checked band, which is um, symbolic of Stuarts. But in the fourth quarter, you can see there um, a Demi Negro uh, and in his dexter hand, a dagger proper. Um, so he's emerging from the waves of the sea and um, there, he's not bound or chained, but there's a, a Demi Negro emerging from the sea with a dagger. Um, and this is clearly symbolic of um, Duncan Darach's uh, trade in uh, and the, how he made his fortune in Jamaica. Um, so this is clearly a direct reference to the slave trade um, and it's found its way into the arms not just of Duncan Darach but as I uh, said the, royal, the arms of the Royal Borough of Guruk and in recent years there's been considerable concern about this very prominent public display um, of an enslaved person in public places around Guruk. <coughs> Um, the next coat of arms I'd like to draw to your attention are the arms of Sir Alexander Grant of Dalvey, Baronet. Um, now, he was granted supporters, and as Kristen said earlier, Baronets don't typically get supporters, so he too was the recipient of the favour of King George III and was granted supporters by a royal warrant in 1761, which specifically said, We are well appraised of the loyalty and affection of our trusty and well beloved Sir Alexander Grant of Dalvey, Baronet. So as a result of this royal warrant from 1761, he was allowed to add two supporters, and you can see a Scotsman, a soldier in Highland dress here, and on the other side is a Negro, again, or a representation of an African, again, not chained and not carrying the flaming torch, but um, nevertheless, he has a, a um, Negro supporter in the um, sinister side. Um, however, despite this mark of royal patronage and royal favorite, favoritism, um, we know that Grant of Dalvey owned an estate in Jamaica and at his death in 1773 he owned 672 enslaved people, um, 343 were male and 329 were female. Um, and the total value of his estate um, at his death was about £102,000 in Jamaican currency of which over half, 61, just over £61,000 uh, was the value of the enslaved people. So he owned huge amounts of money on the back of enslaved people and obviously chose to represent that in his supporters. Um, the next coat of arms we found um, that also fell into this category were the arms of um, Robert Glasgow of Mount Greenan. Now the arms themselves, the shield, shows a coconut tree from a plantation, um, but again his crest is a demi-negro holding a sugar cane, um, and again not bound but clearly a representation of um, his plantation connections. And these arms were granted in 1807, which was actually the year the slave trade was abolished in theory, although we know it continued after that in the UK. Um, it was abolished in 1807. Um, and Robert Glasgow owned plantations in St Vincent with enslaved people. Um, I, part of the history of this is that following the abolition of slavery by the UK government in, the 18, in 1807, um, by the 1830s they started to pay reparations. Now these were not compensation to the freed slaves for having been enslaved, but these were compensation to the owners of the slaves for having to give up their property, which as we can see was, could be incredibly valuable. Um, and Robert Glasgow had died by this point, but his son-in-law, who was formerly Robert Robertson, but took the name and the estate of Robert Glasgow of Mount Greenan, um, was awarded £13,000 from the government in, 18, in the 1830s to compensate for his loss of um, slave holdings. So these are three examples um, of people with um, representations in Scotland um, with enslaved people on their arms or their crests. Um, we were 
delighted to find that there were no further examples so far that we've come across um, and certainly that none of them had used the um, chains or the binding that we saw in those earlier examples from England and Ireland. But nevertheless, there is evidence that people in Scotland, critically at the time that Scott was being granted his supporters in the, at the end of the 1700s and into the early 1800s, people in Scotland were adopting um, representations of enslaved people on their arms. However, it is also very much the case that there are other representations of um, Moors or Africans in Scottish heraldry. So having established quite clearly that there are arms in Scotland with a slaving connection, uh, we also wanted to explore when there are representations of Moors or Africans that do not have a slaving connection. And the first example, one of the most prominent examples, is the Clan Morrison. And you can see uh, in the centre of their coat are these three um, Moors' heads in that very distinctive triad there. Um, and I have other examples. Um, Jean Morrison uh, has, and you can tell that they're ladies' arms because they're in the distinctive um, lozenge shape rather than the shield shape. Um, her arms show three uh, Moors' heads, and her crest is the triad, the three heads um, about each other. Um, the Walker Morrison arms are over here, and you can see the first and fourth quarters have these three Moors' heads again. Um, or Africans' heads, and the um, crest is the three, the triad of three again. So it's very clear that Morrison's arms, uh, if you're a Morrison, then somewhere on your arms you're likely to bear um, representations of Moors. And the question is, why is that? Um, well, one answer might lie in the derivation of the name Morrison from Morris, which is derived from Morisco, meaning Moorish. So the name itself, Morrison, might be derived from Moorish, um, and in which case these would be canting arms, which is a pun on the surname of the um, holder of the arms, so linking it to Moors. So Morrison could be derived from connection to Moors. Moors. It could alternatively be derived from St. Morris. Um, now, St. Morris uh, was an Egyptian Roman general uh, who was a slave, I think, at one stage, and then became a Christian and then a saint, and he was very popular across Europe in the 1400s. And we can see here the arms of Coburg in Germany, feature um, the town's patron Saint St. Morris, um, and these arms were granted in 1493. Now there was a period um, in the 1900s, um, 1800s and 1900s, and then particularly during the Nazi regime when there was some whitewashing going on, and this turned into a white uh, head, but it's now been reinstated as it should be the um, head of St. Morris, the Egyptian Roman general and then saint. Um, and there are other um, towns in the Livonia region, which is Latvia and Estonia, which also bear um, the head of St. Morris as a tribute to him and their connection with him. So we have clear examples of Moors and uh, St. Morris. We also have the arms of Lord Borthwick. And it's not quite clear, but you can just see uh, Lord Borthwick, again for his crest above the coat of arms, has a Moor's head. And this, allegedly, is a tribute to his um, ancestor's pilgrimage uh, with the heart of Robert the Bruce, um, following Bruce's death to the, uh, well, they only got as far as Spain, but uh, it was the pilgrimage uh, on the Crusades there. So there are some families in Scotland who claim a moor, either on the arms or the crest, um, because of their crusading connections, so much further back in time. Um, and we can see that there are very clear examples of moors in arms all around the Mediterranean. So these are some examples of arms and flags from Corsica, Sardinia and Aragon, which show moors heads. And a moors head is always um, very clearly uh, depicted with that white headband, um, which is a symbol of um, defeat by the, the conquering uh, invader. And perhaps not surprising that we find so many examples around the Mediterranean area for obvious reasons. So I want to finish, though, um, having demonstrated that there are arms in Scotland with a very clear slaving connection, and there are also arms that have connections to Moors and to Crusades that are not uh, um, representative of slaving trading activities. Um, one final example that I'd like to turn to from England, where the arms do show uh, an enslaved person, but in a very different context. And these are the arms of Sir Thomas Fowle Buxton, the first baronet. And you can just see, it's very difficult to make out, there's a clearer image coming up. But on his crest, which is a stag's head, the crest is bearing a medallion which shows a moor's head. And, it's, um, and his supporter is an African sable as well. We can see this here, supporter is meant to be an African sable. 
um, wreathed about the loins and the crest is a buck's head uh, gorged with a collar um, and there's a pendant with an African's head sable. And you can see it slightly more clearly on this monument to him here. So he was the MP for Weymouth and he was granted um, his supporters and indeed this specific charge um, as a very clear tribute to um, his anti-slaving activities. And in granting uh, the royal warrant from Queen Victoria in 1840, she said she was desirous of giving an additional mark of our royal favour in commemoration of his exertions towards the abolition of slavery. So there are examples of enslaved people in coats of arms where in fact it's a celebration of the holders work towards the abolition of slavery. So the question that Crispin and I then had to address um, was where does Scott fall in this? It is certainly clear that around the time Scott was granted his supporters, people were adopting enslaved people on their arms, representations of Moors or Africans to represent that trade with the colonies. We know that he was friends with Lord Melville from his correspondence, and I'm sure you're all aware of the controversy about the Melville Monument in St Andrew's Square, which has had a plaque up to refer to the slaving connections, and the plaque's now coming down, so um, the uh, Lord Melville in, in himself is controversial in this context, um, but there are also clear examples of Moors being used to represent more historic connections uh, with the Mediterranean. So, where did Scott fall in all this? I shall hand you back to Crispin to find out. Thank you, Gillian. So, um, although I'm doing this bit and Gillian did that bit, uh, most of it is uh, a joint effort of both of us in uh, one way and another. But it seemed a convenient way uh, to divide up the talk. So, our starting premise was that it probably had a slavery connection, because that is what had been suggested to us by uh, Kelly uh, when she first drew our attention uh, to Scott's arms. Now, did he have a slaving connection? We researched uh, as many articles as we could. One article referred to him living next door to many fellow countrymen who were variously involved in the slave trade. Uh, Abbotsford, uh, trust uh, we approached and they said that they had done some detailed research and produced a paper uh, which suggested there was no saving connections. I'll leave you to read the uh, quotes from, from that paper. But I think what's interesting is Frederick Douglass, who was a famous freedom fighter and ex-slave, who in fact adopted the name uh, Douglas from Scots, uh, the Lady of the Lake. Um, his adoption uh, of that name is, is recorded uh, on that basis. And also we had William Wells Brown, who was a freed slave and, uh, and an abolitionist, also visited Abbotsford. So as far as we could tell from uh, researching the literature and other sources and talking to people, uh, there was no indication uh, that Scott was involved uh, in the slave trade uh, either as an investor or owning any property uh, or ha having any office uh, which might reflect on that <coughs> issue. So that seemed to clear Scott at that level, but why adopt uh, the Moor? Well, research uh, took us first to, to look at what came from the Scott side and uh, we established that was the mermaid uh, and the crest uh, were both from the Scot side. And we established that the, uh, that the Moor uh, supporter appeared to have come from uh, the Halliburton side, from Lord Halliburton of Dalton, sometimes Lord of Dalton, sometimes Lord of Halliburton, and so on, from whom Scott descended. Uh, one of the junior branches descended uh, was the Halliburtons of Merton. So we then tried to find uh, the Halliburton coat of arms uh, which might support that this is where it came from. And we first of all went to Nisbet's heraldry. He was a writer in the uh, early 18th century, 1720s or thereby. And he noted that Lord Halliburton of Dalton, 
Christ's arms were recorded in ancient manuscripts. So we then had to do a trawl around uh, to find uh, there's somebody doing research into all the heraldic manuscripts in Scotland. So we approached uh, Eileen uh, for information uh, on that, and she came back saying that uh, Lord Halliburton of Dalton or so on, his arms were recorded uh, in the Foreman Workman manuscript, which runs from about 1560 to about 1600, and there appear to be six different contributors uh, to that manuscript. And the Halliburton title was created in 1450, it was extinct uh, by 1580, so those arms which are shown on the right must uh, have uh, been in existence between 1450 and 1580 to have been uh, recorded there. And you will see uh, that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, you will see that uh, he's got a moor on either side and a moor's head uh, as his crest. Uh, the, there's the, the Halliburton, Cameron, Vans or Vaux uh, are all in the quarters and they were the different heiresses who had been swallowed up by the Halliburtons of, of Dalton. And none of them uh, seem to have a, a more uh, connection at all. So why Halliburton, Lord Halliburton, had those. And you'll see that the uh, Africans uh, are depicted very much as they appear in Scott's arms, but without the flaming torch, which no doubt was given as a difference uh, from the Lord Halliburton arms. Because normally, if you're a junior branch of the family, you can get the same symbolism, but with some difference to show that uh, you're not using uh, the original or principal arms. We gave up trying to find out why Lord Halliburton uh, had Africans, uh, Moors, as his supporters. Uh, there were certainly Africans at the Scottish court uh, at that time. And there's, uh, you can find online some uh, National Records of Scotland uh, articles on the subject and references to, to it. Uh, some of them are to musicians, drummers, and so on. One is to a lady, and there's a treasury uh, noting up at the cost of her clothing, uh, which was quite substantial and really put her in the aristocratic bracket when you look at the level of money she was spending on it. So they certainly knew about Africans uh, at that time. Maybe Dalton was trading, uh, trading with... Uh, the Baltic, where uh, various Baltic trading houses used St. Morris uh, and his symbolism uh, for their coats of arms and for their trade, but we couldn't come to uh, any firm conclusion on why that might be the case. So we then asked if there were any examples at Abbotsford, and uh, the Abbotsford Trust came back saying, uh, there was some silver uh, which Scott had, and you will note that his silver uh, was engraved with what in heraldic terms is a savage man, which is a well-known Scottish supporter for a lot of families, and it's a white man uh, with a, a wreath of leaves around his middle, uh, and but white, and with a sort of no headband uh, or anything like that. So another enigma is why did Scott feel embarrassed by his uh, Moor supporter that when he got his silver engraved, he had it engraved with a savage rather than uh, with uh, an African Moor. And then <clears throat> also other examples uh, of Scott uh, on the right uh, in, in a book page and things where again, but it's black this time, but again he's a typical savage rather than a Moor. However, by the time uh, Scott's son-in-law, uh, Lockhart Scott, or Lockhart as he was originally, uh, before he inherited the estate, he re-recorded the arms uh, in 1848, and again we've got the clear uh, 
more uh, depicted uh, on his arms when, when he re-recorded them. So that's another little enigma that comes out uh, at the end. So what's the conclusion? Well, I'm pleased to say our conclusion is there was no evidence of a slavery connection, at least uh, in Scott's time, uh, to the Moor proper, uh, which you see there, uh, and uh, in relation to Abbotsford uh, as well. Whether the Halibutton connection had anything to do with slavery uh, in the 1580s, when we see Mr. Uh, the Hawkins arms, which uh, Gillian referred to, he was slave trading uh, at the end of the uh, 15th century, so yeah, 15th, 1500s, end of 1500s uh, 16th, end of the 16th century, the 1500s. So there could be a slavery connection there, but Scott adopted that supporter because he was proud of his Halliburton descent and his heirship uh, to the barons of Merton, who one believes were probably the senior representatives of the Lords Halliburton's line. So that's our talk. We've got to thank Kelly Foster for drawing our attention to it, Kirsty Archer Thompson, who's uh, the researcher at the Abbotsford Trust. She gave us a lot of information. She took those photographs for us, and uh, she wrote the article which uh, we quoted for. We did approach this club, and uh, uh, Michael said uh, he didn't know of any slavery connection, and he hoped to God we wouldn't find one. <laughs> uh, so he pointed us in the right direction, and of course the Lion Court for allowing us uh, to use those uh, images from the from the manuscript. So thank you for listening to us. I'm uh, glad we've been able to say that Scott didn't adopt that supporter due to any connection with the slave trade. I just wonder if he wasn't being a little tricky by accepting the flaming torch of the slaves in rebellion to indicate that he was opposed to slavery and hoped they would rebel. But that's just me being facetious about it. Thank you. so much um, Sir Crispin and Professor Black for such a rich and detailed and illuminating talk and I think we could probably all agree that you've given us a lot to think about and many questions are uh, opened there and, and sort of possibilities to think about as well um, and hopefully many questions to ask too <laughs> uh, because now is the opportunity that we can ask any questions so any, I'd like to open the floor to any questions for our speakers this evening. There is a sympathetic reference in um, Guy Mannering to the Maroons, who were the renegade slaves in Jamaica. Probably prompted by the Second Maroon War of 1795-96, um, I think. Well, they, 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 they certainly one. did a bit of burning down. I'm afraid Julian and I didn't read all of Scott. No, no. <laughs> find something, yes. and uh, there as we are, none could come up with any things. But thank you for that. That's a useful point which might like factor be. in. Yes. And there's another somewhat hand coming out from behind. Hand behind the pillar. Ah, yes. Um, the thoughts arise. Uh, one thing leads to another. I lately read the study of the. Um, <clears throat> The history of William Ewart Gladstone and the Gladstone families, plural. Um, the father of William Ewart Gladstone was uh, a farming stock from Bigger uh, into the grain trade and made a fantastic fortune um, on the grain trade at the uh, time of the American Civil War. But he also had one of the biggest plantations in Guyana, in fact, where Demerara comes from. And in fact, there's one of the big rebellions was the Demerara. Sugar Rebellion, <coughs> the Slaves' Rebellion. So you lead me to the question, um, hmm, do the Gladstones, um, being as well off as they became, uh, have an interesting escutcheon? So maybe not for you to answer, but I must look it up. If I was a long lion, could advise. <laughs>
I, I think we might have picked it up uh, if if it did. Yes. If, yes. if they had, if they had matriculated arms in Scotland oh. with a slaving connection, we would have picked it up because we literally turned every page in the volumes of the register um, during the slaving time. During the slaving so time, benignly left it out, um, because interestingly enough, Gladstone Senior got the biggest handout of slavery in, in money in the whole of Scotland. Although we put some of the money back into Leith and uh, Good Works, mm -hmm. but it's a most uh, a complex. Um, historical time and interesting one. Thank you. We'll, we'll look into that <coughs> to see. Yes. Um, I was interested in your reference to Sir Thomas Fowle Buxton, as my wife and her family are descended from. I think you possibly underrated his importance. I mean, Wilberforce gets the, the attention because he only, well, only, he only abolished the <coughs> slave trade in 1870. And you mentioned the abolition. Fowle Buxton led the parliamentary campaign to have slavery abolished, which was why he ended up with this uh, heraldic uh, sport. And because that led to the compensation. Um, it's interesting that the Treasury, as recently as 2015, claimed credit for having paid off all the compensation. They quickly withdrew their information on, on that. And interestingly also, my wife's family quite often get invited to events Thanks. on slavery. And they always make this point, which I think is important and relevant. Yes, they're descended from Sir Thomas Fowlbuxton, they are also descended, however, from people who had interest in slavery and slum plantations. And I think this shows you the complexity of the thing. Mm -hmm. My final point is the Moors. You reminded me, in the 16th century, the Moors were raiding England and capturing white people from England as slaves. Right. Linda Colley's book, Captains, do very well for this, because England was very weak at that time, so it's quite interesting. Uh, so I think the Halliburton connection on that is a bit dubious. But, yes. but anyway, it's never seen. Yes, uh, I think we feel that representations of Moors yes. in heraldry are not problematic the no, way that no, yeah. representations of enslaved people. Yes, indeed, indeed. I, yeah. Well, all the pub signs, the crusades, perhaps. Yeah, crusades. Yes. I think. Uh, I mean, we didn't cover ourselves no, in glory no, necessarily, quite. but not as well, damaging as, as, as the scene now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, indeed, at the time it was uh, very glorious. Anyway. Well, we only picked up the Buxton Arms because. Yes. Well, uh, it's interesting because, no, because we are related because we both. Uh, you both are descended from daughters of the Earls of Gainsborough. Oh, 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 I have no connection. Well, <laughs> and, well, and the present baronet is called Crispin too. Yes, right, well, yeah. more or not. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, going, going back into your just looking through the evidence, um, was, yeah, one other thing occurs to me is that how good are the records of the compensation that was actually paid to the owners in the 1830s? Because if, uh, you know, um, Scott's money troubles are extremely well documented, and if he'd had a handout for a slave investment, it might have helped him a little bit in those. So did you have a chance to look at any records on, the, on paying compensation at all? Or was there anything paid to the family? So that's a good point. And um, we should cross check that. I mean, I think it's certainly been widely known if Scott had had a payout. Right. And I don't think the payouts were made until the 1830s, so he right. wouldn't have been able fault. to. No. So, um, there's a fantastic website run by, um, I, I've got the reference here, by one of the U London universities where they document all the payouts yes, that were yes, made and you can right. search against yes. it and like, you can get yes, all this UCL, data. I think. UCL. Yes. Yes. Right, so we uh, actually have UCL. that. Right? Oh, very uh, detailed. Yeah. Incredibly detailed. How many slaves, where they were owned, yeah. uh, how much was paid out for them. Um, it's <clears> a staggering <throat> amount of work going into it. Um, <clears throat> but I should just double check to make sure the Scott name does not pop up. Well, the nice yeah, to learn that. Was, that yes. was from where you got the Dalvey. So the Dalvey yes. and the Robert Glasgow yeah. Mount Greenan data came from and, there. Um, another point is famously the money that was paid back to the slave owners, of course, was reinvested in the British Railways. Or a substantial amount of that capital yeah. was invested to build the railways in the UK. So. Um, <laughs> Well, and, and a lot of it, as we know, was given was given philanthropically. Uh, and Col, uh, Col, what's his name in Bristol, Colston, who yes, uh, had his statue pulled down oh, yes, yes, because yes. he founded schools and all mm -hmm. sorts of other mm -hmm. things. With, with, yeah. On the back of the sleeving money. Mm -hmm. Did you? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm very interested in the, this term, uh, the moor. Uh, because I'm not a historian and specialist in this area, but I always understood that the dynamics of the slave trade uh, had moors from North Africa acting as the middlemen 
between the abduction of native Africans, who were then brought by the Moors, so-called, down to the coast uh, to be handed over to uh, European slave owners and ship's captains for transportation. Uh, Moor, in your terms, are, are, you, uh, are you distinguishing between uh, an Islamic uh, North African from the native Africans of the West African interland? It's, the word Moor seems to come from the Crusade times, yes. um, particularly with the Moors who invaded Spain. Yes. And they were called the Moors and the Moorish and so on. They were, they were sorry? They were not Negroes. They were not Negroes. They were not Negroes. And they were into slavery, yeah. let's say. And they were into slavery as well. Uh, I believe south of the Sahara, yeah. you frequently find one tribe capturing yeah. another tribe and taking them uh, to the, uh, what was then called the Gold Coast or yeah. so on, to where they were picked up by the transatlantic slave trade. That's right. Yeah. And that, I think, was a different. Yes slave trade from the one that took place north of the Sahara. Yeah. But the so-called Moor and heraldry is depicted as a black African okay. uh, rather than... And there is a distinction sometimes between a Saracen and a Moor. But a Saracen, who again is, would otherwise be a North African... Uh, uh, a North African Muslim is depicted with a head of armor and then a sort of adult, adult face. Uh, so you find the Saracen and the Moor. But the Moor has become taken to be an African head okay. rather than okay. Okay. rather than a North African. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the picture of Scott's uh, coat of arms, uh, it's definitely a black African rather than a, what one might, might describe as a, a Moor from from the from from the uh, Mediterranean coast, yeah. so it's all rather muddled up. Yeah, very. Yes. <laughs> yes. I've just got a, a little comment. You uh, mentioned the question of whether the Halibertans had traded in the Baltic. Yes. Um, as far as I know, and I can check this again, there was at least one Halibertan who was fighting in the Northern Crusades in the 1390s. And some other Scottish knights who went there, it took what they called Prussia, but which is a bit further east than we would now say is Prussia, um, did make a connection there and then came back to trade. So it's entirely possible that the Halliburtons did that too. Yes. Well, yeah. you know, thank you for that contribution. Yeah. We didn't sort of. Yeah go down that route in, in any great detail. No, but if you're interested at all. Oh, yes, yeah. very, because yeah. these things tend to take on a life of their own and we might give another talk in which case we'll incorporate uh, all the comments. But thank you for that. But, you know, why sometime between 1450 and 1580 is Lord Halliburton adopting two moors? And uh, the fact that they naked apart from um, could it yeah. could it just be something like people had exotic birds and exotic animals mm -hmm. but you had exotic people yes you know, so they, it's sort of just that but, um, but they, they with no to, deeper sort of but they not at they're all. not yeah. depicted clothes you know there's the band of decency and the band round the head which is believed to be a symbol of having been captured. And you had a band put around your head to indicate that you've been captured and so on. So uh, they, they were just exotic people, but come from a sort of semi-naked background, which, you know, why? But then equally, why are so many Scottish families have their supporter who are wild men, who are white men, with a band of leaves around their private parts. Um, and that's a very popular supporter in Scotland. Yeah. Would... I'm just going to ask that you've answered it, because um, being at the Fife Arms Hotel um, a number of times, there's a huge coat of arms in the front entry area. And there's these two men who are white, 
and the only clothing is these leaves. <laughs> and I wondered why, why would an earl or a duke have these on his hand? It seemed a puzzle for them. Yeah. It is a puzzle, but it's a very popular uh, supporters in, in sort of Highland, <clears throat> high, Highland and mid Scotland families. <laughs> and Stephen, you were. Yes, I was just going to say that given the Scots' prominence and popularity and the intensity of the anti slavery debates, it seems likely that if he had been pro slavery, it would have been known at the time. Yes, but equally, we didn't find anything to suggest that he'd written against it or uh, anything like that. I think in one of his books, there's a reference to uh, ships trading. Kind of Robert of Paris. Paris, I think. Yeah. So I think this was the part of the enigma, is that Scott was just silent on the whole question in either direction. As far as we as, can see. As far as we, yeah. But you're all the experts, so we're <laughs> hoping to be corrected and have all sorts of additional information provided. I thought there might have been a question over here, and maybe it's mistaken, I thought I saw something. Are there any further questions from anybody? I know this has been quite a lot, and I'm sure something we can continue later on um, as well. But if there are no further questions at the present moment, then I'd like to invite Lord Stuart to give the vote of thanks, if any. Well, thank you for inviting us to speak. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. To talk about uh, Sir Walter Scott's connection with slavery reminds me, if you will permit, of remarks heard at a Robert Louis Stevenson club event when a stalwart of the club told the people around him that he was writing an article about Robert Louis Stevenson and golf. Now, there was a shuffling of feet, silence, furtive looking from one to another until one brave voice pop, piped up. Doctor, I didn't know that Robert Louis Stevenson played golf. And Dr. Davidson said, he didn't play golf. That's the point of the article. <laughs> Reassuring it is to discover that Sir Walter had no connection with Atlantic slavery, either personal or ancestral. As has been indicated by Professor Black, the charge against Scott is not his connection with slavery, but his silence on the subject. At best, his very occasional elliptical and euphemist euphemistic references, such as when Bailey, Nicol Jarvie, and Rob Roy expatiating on the merits of rum says, quote, good wear has often come for a wicked market. <laughs> I personally think the criticism of Scott in this regard is unjustified. Every picture tells a story, they say, and nowhere, perhaps, as our speakers have so well demonstrated, is this more truly said than of heraldic achievements. Scott's personal achievement in both senses was the red hand of baronetage, which we've seen at the centre of his arms. An interesting subject, if I may suggest for further inquiry, given that uh, red hands appear in both red gauntlet or red hand stories in both red gauntlet and in the antiquary. And as we've seen in the Western Mediterranean generally, the Blackamoor's head features frequently, for example, an example that was on the screen in the arms of Corsica. Originally, I believe, the Corsican moor was blindfolded. James Boswell's friend, General Paoli, insisted that the Corsican moor's blindfold be turned into a sweatband, saying, do not let people say that we Corsicans fear the light. I'm sure this audience knows well 
the crest of the McClellan clan, which has a Blackmoor's severed head, <coughs> derived, it is said, from a story about a character known as Black Morrow, not to be confused, I hope, with our learned Lord Lyon, King of Arms, Dr. Joseph Morrow. Please join me in showing our appreciation to Professor Black and Sir Crispin for a truly fascinating and informative talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And I think to go back to the Corsican point you made, I think St. Morris's, uh, he was martyred, which was why he became a saint. And I, my recollection is that part of the martyrdom was he was blindfolded. And that's why originally his head tended to be shown blindfolded, but then it was moved up to the sort of African band which we see in Morris. I might have got that wrong, that's just my recollection. No, thank you all very much, and particularly for the uh, additional comments uh, and particularly the insights into some of Scott's work. That's been much appreciated, and we shall add that into our work in this area. So thank you all for your comments and contributions. Um, just before we, we depart, just to remind everybody that, as ever, there'll be uh, canopies and, and wine uh, in a reception just outside, so do hope that people are able to stay uh, for that afterwards. To take a moment to look slightly further ahead, and I'll have to look at my note to remind myself of the date, the next talk is on Tuesday the 11th of April at 7pm, when Lady Joyce Kaplan will be talking to us about the dark heart of Midlothian, justice, truth and the law. Um, so Lee has assured me that there are tickets still available for that and they're available this evening as well so if you don't have a ticket already and would like to come those are available there and so I think all that remains to be said um, is once again a very great thank you to uh, Professor Black and Sir Crispin Agnew for a talk this evening thank you very much